Can you imagine what it would be like to have children in three different decades of your life? Well, today, Dr. Frida Birnbaum, PhD, joins us to tell us exactly about that. She's a research psychologist and psychotherapist in Saddle River, New Jersey, and she's also the author of Life Begins at 60, A New View of Motherhood, Marriage, and Reinventing Ourselves, as well as the book What Price Power, an in-depth study of the professional women in a relationship. She's also the mother of five and the last two twins she had at the age of 60. So please join us today to talk to Dr. Frida. Welcome to the Teaching Your Toddler interview podcast, where we feature experts, authors, personalities, and entrepreneurs to help with everything related to parenting. Find out about us at teachingyourtoddler.com and enjoy the show. Thank you so much for joining us today on the Teaching Your Toddler podcast. Today, we have Dr. Frida Birnbaum, and she is going to talk to us about parenting across eras. So Dr. Frida, please tell us a little bit about yourself. Yes. Well, I had children younger when I was uh, 26. I had two beautiful children. And then when I was older, um, I had a child at the age of 53, and then at the age of 60, I had twins. Oh my goodness. Yes. And um, it's uh, interesting that, you know, uh, women now are having children later, even Mm -hmm. into their fifties. I received a huge response, not because of the children, the twins, but because of redefining age and what age means to women uh, who were really very happy to know that they can start all of over again. And, uh, careers, our relationships, our locations. Uh, so that's what helped them to see that you don't have to be old at a certain number. Uh, as far as my children are concerned, uh, I feel that uh, we are catching up, living longer, and they're doing very well. They're 15 right now. Hmm. So that makes me how old? I can't even say the number. But <laughs> so <laughs> can't believe it. Uh, so, uh, you know, get it all in, I have to tell you. So, uh, yeah, so parent, what was your question? My personal uh, experience during parenting? Yeah, or just about yourself. I mean, your work, whatever, you know, I know you have a podcast, yes. the things like that. So I've been in uh, this business as psychologist for more than 30 years. I have a podcast, uh, The Dr. Frida Show, D-O-C-T-O-R. I have um, a new radio show now, Ask Dr. Frida, uh, D-R-F-R-I-E-D-A. So that's an exciting part. And I'm doing shows like yourself and uh, TV appearances, um, along with my, uh, you know, practice that I have uh, that's been uh, busy as well. Absolutely. And what does your practice focus on? Uh, It focuses on individuals, groups, families. Uh, Basically, uh, I focus uh, on moving ahead in life quickly. I don't deal with necessarily treating people uh, with medications, although I would refer them to someone else. I believe more in lifestyle changes uh, that need to be done. Medications sometimes have bigger side effects and they help. Uh, So basically, I've been very fortunate that people that do come to see me are more people like myself, which I'm not crazy, but more mainstream people uh, that really has societal pressures that we all have. Life keeps coming up with all different types of situations. And it's just about coping and somebody to talk to and somebody to, uh, you know, diffuse your feelings. So therapy has really changed. The meaning of therapy doesn't have a stigma. I have people come in here, say hello to each other. I have people uh, from the media, people who are uh, the head of a stock company, are very successful people, um, and they're very comfortable. So it's really changed, uh, I'm happy to say. That is great. And so you're seeing a lot of people that are just sort of challenged by parenting and life in general. Is that kind of what you're, you're absolutely, describing? Absolutely. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. And parenting is something that I'd like your listeners to know that the hard days and the hard years do leave eventually. Mm -hmm. And I found myself, I remember once on vacation, looking back and seeing this mother with the small little boy and my son who was already grown at the time, I was in tears. And I said, 
where did the time go? And of course, I said how cute he was. And she looked at me like, get away from me, lady, but whatever. She was doing her own <laughs> thing. But uh, the thing is that, yes, when you live the moments and they're very difficult, uh, realize that they're fleeting moments as well and to cherish um, everything that you have. And just quickly, uh, women who work at home, the most depressed women are those that have to uh, stay home with under uh, school, preschool children. It's the most difficult time. And women who do work and have careers, and this is my research, um, are exhausted, but they're not depressed. Well, that's interesting. Huh. Yeah. It, why do you think that is? What's the correlation there? Well, you know, when you have your whole life and uh, my practice uh, at one time centered around women coming to see me in their 30, mid 30s, 40s, saying what happened to my life. And so when you're when you've gone and pursued a career uh, and then you have children, you say, OK, what what about me? What did I work all this? What did I do all this for to stay home? I love my children, but it's not enough. So that creates depression. And so the question has always been. Uh, family first or career first? That's been a huge, huge question, even today. And sometimes to avoid frustration, to have more time, and even financial assets, uh, it's good to have your career. Uh, so there's no resentment, because we are having children later, not as late as me, but later. <laughs> Do you coach moms that are stay at homes to try to find something that kind of either mimics a career or even try to restart their career? Uh, not all moms want uh, careers. Some are very satisfied, but the ones that came to me were not. And starting a career is something to do that you are representing a part of yourself. It's something that creates an image because the image of mom doesn't seem to be enough today. The, although children need their mothers, but more research has shown that guess what? Children who are the most confident have mothers who work outside the home. So even with that, and not to say, oh, moms are not important, and how dare you, and we're bringing up children that are going to be productive in society. But then again, uh, you're also somebody here that wants to be productive in society. And mothers are really doing everything. They're wonderful. But they're overdoing it, too, as I've spoken before about helicopter parenting and play dates mm. and after school activities. And it's too it's not that they have an easy job. On the contrary, being a mother is one of the hardest jobs because it doesn't stop. Mm -hmm. Even when the kids are in school, they're not on vacation. They're shopping for food. They're making dinner. They're they're getting plans ready for the family. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's a tough, tough job. Mm -hmm. uh, but to have a sense of your identity, sometimes it's good. Research has shown that the children thrive when mothers are working outside the home. Something you touched on, though, just a second ago with the helicopter is in that way, we're making it m more difficult for ourselves. Right. Like when we and, are yes. so involved in that kind of thing. Right. And for the children, too. You know, children have heavy schedules. They're, they're in school all day. They have mm -hmm. to sit at that desk and listen to the teachers. And they have to uh, be able to do their homework when they get home. And they have to learn social cues. And they have to be, be comfortable with the peer pressure. A lot, a lot is going on. And then what about sports? It seems to be so prominent, sometimes even more than the grades, mm -hmm. which is a sad thing in itself. So they come home, they're exhausted. Mm -hmm. And so they need to be able to have nothing to do. And by the way, nothing to do is often the most creative time mm -hmm. because your mind rests and you have time to think about other things, situations in your life. But I talk so much, I forget what the questions were, but I hope I <laughs> it's okay. It. We're just, we're just having a conversation. So one of the things that you mentioned is that you did have children in different eras of your life and, and you're certainly different people. I mean, I know I'm a completely different person than I was when I was 26. Um, and so how, how does that sort of change? How did your parenting evolve, I guess, as having children sort of um, younger now, I mean, 26 now is kind of considered young, I suppose. And then, uh, you know, upward into your fifties and sixties. Definitely more relaxed, mm -hmm. uh, definitely more playful, and, you know, uh, research has always shown that the first child is the most intense and serious because the parents are most intense and serious. Mm -hmm. So 
What happens, I can laugh at it because I know that this too shall pass. Teenage years, the rebellious years, I think I used to be worried about it. Oh my God, they're going into the world like this. And now I'm saying how cute. So (laughs) it's all different. I'm happy to say um, that these twins I have were amazingly easy. Uh, First, they have each other, uh, but uh, their personalities, uh, their uh, orientations for school and socially. And so I'm very fortunate that I had this uh, with them. And they're growing into being uh, nice young people. To say, yeah. Are they identical or fraternal? No, they're fraternal and they don't even look like brothers. They look very different. Oh. One looks more like my husband mm. uh, with darker hair, a, a, a olivey skin, and I uh, more fair and blonde and the other looks like me. So oh. we have a little of each in our lives. <laughs> One of each. that's nice so you said you know it's more relaxed is that do you feel like you like you said you just you knew what to expect versus on our first ones we don't know we don't know we don't know what we don't know we don't know what we're messing up we don't know what we're doing right right we're on top of every little thing that's why they call it helicopter parenting we're on top of things and a funny story I always share during these interviews or when I, I had culture shock when I went to the elementary school and my boys did their work on a poster and it, you could hardly sort of distinguish what they did and I brought it in and all the parents gathered to show and I was so first I was embarrassed because everyone else's looked like it was done by professionals which probably were or the parents or something then I was very upset that Mm -hmm. this is what's going on, Mm -hmm. that the parents are competing with each other. How sad that is, because eventually the kids have to be on their own. And then what happens? Mm -hmm. We don't have, they they don't have that kind of core, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, ability. Mm -hmm. So that really upset me. And that's going on a lot right now uh, with the way people are bringing up their children. They're too anxious and Some of it has to do with competing with one another. Mm -hmm. Uh, Another research of mine showed that women who were more, um, uh, you know, involved and uh, with their careers or were more uh, involved with promoting themselves were less competitive and less manipulative. And some I wonder uh, if these mothers aren't fulfilled on their own, so they have to do it through their children. Mm. Yeah, yeah, right. That that story reminded me of something when the exact same thing happened with my daughter when in kindergarten and she had to make like a diorama of a jungle or something and we got to school and it and it was like I let her do what it and it looked like a five year old had done it and then I saw yeah. these other parents and and the other dioramas and I thought oh my goodness <laughs> a five year old did not do that and that's unfortunate because it sets up the, these expectations for the kids right of what they're supposed to look like and it's not to their ability I mean no wonder they have issues of course you know if you see the child you know the parents because the parent is the one uh, behind the scene and how sad it is. Uh, We live in an area where uh, people uh, can afford uh, all kinds of help, tutors and whatever. I'm fortunate my children didn't. But then again, that's also, you know, a little bit uh, lopsided. The ones that can have that, as opposed to the ones that can't have tutoring for college exams, whatever that is. And we need to we need to change a lot about our school system having children be more proactive rather than uh, followers, because then we push them out into the world and say, okay, now you be a leader. And they say, well, what does that mean? Mm -hmm. How do you do that? Right. So we need to have more of that. Absolutely. You know, we concentrate a lot on moms. Tell us a little bit about your thoughts on fatherhood, on dad's involvement. in. Well, this is very interesting. Uh, Fathers actually leave more of an impression on children than mothers do. Hmm. Uh, They have more of an effect. Now, uh, the study was done uh, perhaps at a time when there more mothers were staying home, uh, taking care of the children at home. So the fathers represented the outside world. Mm -hmm. Uh, And as more mothers are going out into having careers and working, uh, that, as I said, they're more confident when that happens. So that could easily change. But up to now, it's been the case that Mothers were the ones that were blamed in therapy and fathers were the ones that were recognized uh, for all they have done. So (laughs) 
you know, we need to change that around. And also the good thing about being a father today is they're much more nurturing than they used to be. Mm. Fathers are in the past, um, who was it? Some politician, I don't want to name his name, didn't, um, you know, wasn't involved with his children until they were like 18. Hmm. So, uh, yeah. So today fathers are uh, taking care of their children uh, and they are living longer because of it. Um, mm-hmm. And they have more time to have less responsibility with a woman who felt she wanted more. Mm-hmm. So we're exchanging roles today. And that's a that's a good thing. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. Especially if, if it, a mom is working, right? I mean, it's, it's hard to do all the things, all the mom things and all the work things too. Let's see. Uh, I, I, I think that your experience is amazing. Oh, uh, one of the topics that was suggested here was to talk about social media. How do you think that sort of affects things? Well, that's affected hugely because my younger uh, set of uh, children didn't have social media mm-hmm. at all nothing. Mm-hmm. Today, the percentage of time that these kids spent are um, just most of the time, actually. And uh, yes, a lot of good things have happened. They're connected to society around them. They have information that I don't have. And when they come down to the dinner table to talk, it's not as if they were hiding in their rooms. It's as if they really were connecting to the world politics, tech, uh, technical issues, science, mm-hmm. and also to know that uh, they say gaming is not that great, but research has shown again that gaming helps you to think quicker. And it's also social connection if you're doing it with other people as well. So they're really socially connecting more than in the past Hmm. because they have this availability. Parents, mothers don't have to drive carpool as much. Mm -hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. And in the evening, they're able to see their friends uh, much more often. And my kids... Uh, every evening. One of them likes to go on, one of them hates it, and he doesn't go on at all. They're very different. Mm -hmm. But the one who likes it, you know, he's laughing, he's talking, Mm -hmm. there's girls, there's boys, they're playing these games, and it's a way that they really have fun, Mm -hmm. and they look forward to it. This is the time that they get to do this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's much more social than people think it is. It is. You know, we actually recently relocated to a different place, a different state, and my son still gets to connect with his friends back in our old state because they can get on and play and and play the games and talk to each other and, and have that time. Um, So it is, it is a good connector. I just want to interrupt and say one thing that we have a son. I'm very proud. He was recruited to a wonderful job career. He's set for life. He's 22 in Chicago and he wants Mm -hmm. us to come and visit and see it. But then he ended up FaceTiming us and showing us everything so I said, we don't have to come. We saw it already. <laughs> it says the plane fare and the t- expense right. and the time. And it's just amazing. That's true. So Yeah. So it has its uh, advantages in many ways. Absolutely. Absolutely. For sure. So um, I know one of the things that you, you were talking about is that sort of, um, you know, moms, sometimes they need to just take a step back. They need to be present, but they need to also understand that bigger picture of like, it's not, it's not going to be like this forever. They're not going to be in diapers forever. They're not going to be, you know, whatever temper tantrums do eventually they change, they evolve, right? <laughs> they have different kinds of temper so. tantrums, right? <laughs> but, Especially after the age of two, but go ahead. Yeah. Well, so my question is just, you know, what are, what's sort of your pep talk, I guess, for moms uh, that might be, like you said, in that middle of like the screaming, terrible twos. And they're just like, what am I going to do? How do they get out of that? How do they help themselves? First of all, knowing to have a child or a few is you're blessed uh, to be able to bring a productive human being into the world that can do all kinds of wonderful things. And as I said, knowing that it's temporary helps. Mm -hmm. Uh, but But the one most important thing is how you acknowledge it. Mm. If you make the child feel that there's something wrong, then that takes away the confidence And the best type of parenting is authoritative parenting, which where you have a child where you can support and structure. And that brings children that are more successful and more confident because you're not telling them that they don't know what they're doing and yet you're guiding them to do the right thing. So there's all kinds of parenting, permissive parenting, which means let the child do whatever they want That's not a good thing because the Mm -hmm. kid doesn't know what to do themselves. Mm -hmm. They need something. 
Um, and then there's the authoritarian parent, which I think is really the worst because this parent, it's all around about the parent and the child has to listen to what the parent wants and mm -hmm. that's all. And the child is really not involved at all with mm -hmm. this. And then there's one more, a dismissive, that when the child talks to the parent, um, the parent goes, uh-huh, yeah, uh-huh, uh-huh, I hear you, you're right, right. And the kid knows mm -hmm. that they don't know what they're saying, mm -hmm. that they haven't, they're doing something else. So for your listeners to know, authoritative parenting, supporting uh, the child and yet giving them guidance mm -hmm. so they'll know what to do. And then after that, they'll do it on their own. The mm -hmm. best kind of parenting is that you can hold on to a child long enough for the child to leave on their own rather than push the child away because the child keeps coming back. Oh, oh, that's, yeah, that's great advice. That's yeah. amazing. It is interesting that they really do need that structure. They really do. Even though we think, oh, we're being so, you know, maybe too structured, but they, they crave that because it, it helps them with that, you know, feeling secure in that, in those habits. And in that, again, in that structure, if it's too like free and easy, it's just, they don't, they don't thrive that way. I uh, I have a I have a note here that you know you you talk about spending time with parents is better than extravagant gifts. Tell us a little bit about that. Yes, you know the memories that we all have, uh, and my parents didn't have any money. I can't even say much money. I don't think they had anything. I don't know how they existed, but I never knew about it. Never did mm -hmm. I know that they had problems with money, and uh, we had celebrations and holidays. And my mother made great meals. And every Saturday night, we took turns going to different people's houses. And she took us with them. So we had that, those memories and connections going away on vacation. Uh, it was just to some farm, mm -hmm. sitting there watching a cow move around about in some old pool or something. But I was with my mother and father, you know, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I felt safe. I felt right. nothing could happen to me. Mm -hmm. My husband, interestingly enough, grew up with a nanny. Uh, with lots of money and his best meal was spaghettios because she couldn't cook so she opened up a can of spaghettios while his father and mother were dining mm. out somewhere so what kind of life is that that's mm. it doesn't mean it. yes he had a beautiful uh, house and beautiful car when he got older and what, uh, whatever they could give him but they weren't there and so mm. it's, yeah so that's really what children need time Mm -hmm. Children need time. And by the way, millennials are doing that. Millennials are smart. They don't want to live to work. They want to work to live. And so what they do is they find an environment at work that they like more than the money itself. Mm -hmm. And they'd rather work less and spend more time with the family mm -hmm. rather than make enough money to go on a big vacation. They'd rather have the time. Time is their biggest assets. Mm -hmm. And they'd rather go in the backyard and play with their kids. So they're much smarter than the baby boomers were because we were just so up and so taken by having as many cars, TVs, right. you know, the 1980s, right. That was <laughs> now I'm yep. looking back, but yeah. I always agreed with that. I always agreed. Time is more important. You work, 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 and you don't have time. What's the point? Mm -hmm. You know, they laugh at the Americans, you mm -hmm. know, we save our money for what? Mm -hmm. Right. And they're right. True. Yeah. That's true. Oh, that's great. Well, thank you so much. I really appreciate your time today and telling us, yeah. you know, some of the wisdom that you have from not, not only your own experience, but from your patient's experience. So I really appreciate that. Um, if people want to hear, I know you spoke about it at the beginning and we will absolutely make sure we have links in the show notes to find you, but tell us a little bit more about how to, how can people find you? Well, uh, my website, I hope it's working now is uh, drfrida.com. Uh, D-R-F-R-I-E-D-A.com. And uh, yes, and they'll see me on my uh, shows and on my podcast and my new radio show that I'm starting. Perfect. Excellent. All right. Great. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Thank Frieda. you. It's, it's been, been a, pleasure. a pleasure. Same here. Mm -hmm. Enjoyed it. You made it easy. Oh, thanks. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye-bye. This has been the Teaching Your Toddler podcast with Mary Jo Tinlin. Thank you so much for joining us today. I hope you'll find us on our website at teachingyourtoddler.com, as well as on Facebook at Teaching Your Toddler, on Instagram, and on Twitter at Teaching Toddler. So join us again, and I hope you have a wonderful week. Thank you so much.